Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Wednesday night, SpaceX decided to do their first hopper stream. They had a camera set up, they had a drone flying about, and they had a fully fueled hopper with a Raptor engine on it, preparing to demonstrate that a water tank could indeed fly. If you remember, this vehicle had not exactly been built under clean room conditions. But when the engine came to light, it sprung into action and immediately stopped working. There was a fair amount of post-ignition combustion, but we were assured that's actually perfectly normal because they're required to burn off excess methane when they're venting it. Uh, Elon confirmed afterwards that the problem with it that caused the abort was extra high chamber pressure, which exceeded their parameters, and this was attributed to having fuel and oxidizer, which were denser than were expected, so therefore the engine actually was performing better than it was intended to. So, so SpaceX engineers no doubt tweaked where their red lines were and prepared for another attempt on Thursday night. On Thursday, we never got the official stream, but we had a lot of people that were looking at this with very long focal length cameras, including everyday astronaut Tim Dodd, who was down there with a great camera, who uh, unfortunately, a few minutes into the actual hop, his exposure went away. But you could just see there for a moment, the top of the hopper poking through that cloud there. It was really hard to see through all the clouds and there were a lot of skeptics, but if you compare these before and after pictures from the Lab Padre stream, you can see that it did actually translate sideways as well as going up. And the first official confirmation of course came from Elon who commented that water towers can fly. If you remember, this vehicle was essentially built by a company that usually builds water towers. Then of course it was decked out with the rest of the space flight hardware. Now, they did produce an official drone shot. You can see that it is pretty cloudy there, a lot of dust, a lot of uh, exhaust flames. Very hard to see what's going on. In fact, I can actually see some oscillations in the drone's camera as well. There's so much going on here. Because they have to close down public access roads, they've been doing these tests at night. So everything tends to get dark when things are delayed. But the shot that really sells it to me is this engine shot here. You get to see the engine working, the Mach diamonds, the ground service equipment, so you can see the way the thing is translating across. And you can also see the vibration change as it comes back down towards the ground. Look at the rolling shutter there, that waviness across the screen, that's because of the way the sensor is being read out. Watch again, as it launches, there's a lot of waviness because it's the vibrations, the sound is basically reflecting back and making that camera shake at rates that are much faster than its uh, frame rate. And as it gets up to altitude, the vibration tends to stop, and then when it comes back down, the vibration comes back. If you knew what camera they were using, you could probably collect vibration data from that. But the landing must have been quite smooth, so these images are by Boca Chica Gal and they are posted to the nasaspaceflight.com forums and you can see the landing feet that are designed to compress and crush if they hit too hard. They haven't moved very much at all, they've lost their sheaths for some reason. I'm not really clear on what's going on there, but they haven't absorbed, they haven't crushed under an impact. So this flight was pretty well controlled overall, and that's actually pretty amazing when you consider this is the first flight of a full flow staged combustion cycle engine, and they were able to accurately control the throttle and soft land this thing without crushing those structures. I mean, let's not understate this, they went straight from the test stands to a hover flight with a very complicated engine, very complicated pumping system. And they showed that they have been able to control this vehicle uh, and put it down safely. The only really unexpected thing, well, other than the multiple stalls and holds and delays, uh, the only really unexpected thing or downside is that after that furious fire, they started a grass fire, which wasn't really tackled properly for a couple of hours and mostly I think was they just wanted to let it burn because if it burns now, it was going to burn the next time they flew this. But anyway, from here, Elon has confirmed that the next step will be aiming for about 200 meter hops, so hopefully out of the clouds. 
Uh, here's another setup with the you know, four different cameras, four different angles. The one in the top left is La Padre, and then there's Everyday Astronaut and official SpaceX feeds. It's still early days. The engine obviously works very well, but the actual vehicle is just an early prototype. We're going to have the starships flying, we're going to have more engines, and maybe at some point we will actually see the whole thing flying on top of the massive Super Heavy. But SpaceX was also flying stuff as part of their regular service to the International Space Station. CRS-18 was scheduled to launch on Wednesday. However, it ran into some horrible weather. They had a 10% chance of launching because of the weather quality, largely to do with cumulus clouds and lightning. Hold, hold, hold on. Countdown one. And they had to hold the launch at T-30 seconds. They kept it open as a possibility until the very last minute. But of course, they were able to recycle and on Thursday, they launched. By this point, it, most of this is routine, but because of the atmospheric conditions, we did get some rather spectacular uh, condensation forming in the, you know, in the shock zones during the transonic re-entry here. Look at that image on the left, that is fantastic. You can also see them forming on the right. This is actually a slight edit of the live stream because there's usually a delay on the camera on the spacecraft, so typically these two images, these two video sequences would lag a little. But they're now synchronized here, so you can get an idea of the whole thing. So anyway, the launch went off 100% success. There were a few interesting uh, pieces of hardware on board. There was a new docking adapter so that they will have another place to dock the, the new uh, crew spacecraft. There's a whole bunch of public outreach experiments, including non-Newtonian fluids experiment from Nickelodeon TV, which, if you don't know, is a kids' TV station, and many of their shows feature the green slime, which uh, kids in invariably get splattered with. But yeah, the capsule itself has flown twice to the space station already. This is the third flight for it. It's obviously they have the Apollo 50th sticker on there as well, SpaceX is also using this as an opportunity to test some of their new uh, re-entry thermal protection hardware. Obviously, they are still iterating on the thermal protection system for Starship. There's some talk about them uh, no longer going with the transpiration cooling, but yeah, I think we'll wait to see what actually happens when they fly it. But a more immediate change which is evident for this mission is that in the upper stage, there is a grey stripe now painted just above the black interstage, so this would be the lower part of the upper stage. And this is actually a thermal control system to reduce propellant heating. They're obviously interested in performing these engine burns several hours after the upper stage has been in orbit and if the propellant gets too hot that can change their performance it can reduce their ability to make these post-launch orbit updates so this is a passive thermal control measure that they're going to experiment with now this post-launch orbit you know maneuvering capability is going to be essential for a future mission which they have just won the imaging x-ray polarimetry explorer is supposed to be in a low altitude equatorial orbit with zero degrees inclination normally that launch would require uh, an air launch vehicle such as pegasus however spacex won this launch contract which is quite amazing because to get into a zero inclination orbit, you would normally have your aircraft fly to the equator and then launch the spacecraft from there, so it didn't need to perform a very costly plane change maneuver. But SpaceX is able to do it cheaper than Pegasus, and they have the post-flight orbit change capability to do this, which is quite a lot. It's going to be something like 3.7 kilometers per second uh, delta V when they reach the equator. This is going to be a huge mission, and this effectively has killed Pegasus as a launch vehicle. There's nothing it can do cheaper than SpaceX anymore. So while I have you all here, I think I should give some credit to Russia for finally, after many years, launching the Spectre RG Observatory. And of course, it went up on a proton, a white proton, because it is a you are sorry, a Russian government launch vehicle as opposed to the commercial version. Now, the Spectre X-ray Observatory has been a long time coming, and this launch was even delayed 
uh, because some issues with the spacecraft. But it is a way it will take a few months to reach its final location at the Sun Earth L2 location. That's the Lagrange point on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. It is great to see some Russian space hardware going up to do some research. I think this might actually be the first piece of Russian hardware to go outside the Earth's sphere of influence for a long, long time. The spacecraft carries two different X-ray telescopes that work at different energy ranges. Uh, one has a resolution of 15 arc seconds and the higher energy version only has a resolution of four, uh, 45 arc seconds, so it's three times worse. But it will survey most of the night sky. I mean, that's the whole point. It should be able to point anywhere and not have the planet Earth getting in the way of its important X-ray observations. Thanks to the power of the Proton rocket for putting it all the way out there in deep space. So yeah, this wasn't really a deep space update. This was all about SpaceX and their performance, but I, I really left this out of the last one because I've been very busy. So thanks for everyone for tuning in. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.